before Kiwi, Richard Pearce put forth his claim to be the first person to get into the air, technically heavier than air, flew a plane in layman's terms, 1902. In era prior to when planes dominated the skies completely, there were airships. They came in all shapes and sizes. Size being large or extra large. From Spain, France, England, US of A, a rough guess looking at this photo. The band Jimmy Page and Robert Plant were in. The name best associated with the term airship. Down even to this neck of the woods. As I've covered in a recent video about wacky Kiwi inventions, the ones that sometimes never get off the design board or conception even, here in New Zealand, these airships fascinated the public were at one point cutting edge technology, appeared to be the future of transport in the skies. Hard to believe, in the decade between 1920 and 30, what we would now term the Commonwealth countries came together to form the Imperial Airship Company, linking England to her domains. Barnes Wallace, he of bouncing bomb fame, cut his teeth designing dirigibles for this very airship company. The idea was to offer the first true airline airmail service. Indeed, the project did, as they say, get off the ground. This is MR100 cruising across Toronto skyline in 1930. Cruising speed, by the way, was a respectable 100 kilometres per hour. The crash of Hur, sister ship, R101, in France later that year, killing 48 of the 54 on board, and coupled with the Great Depression, rather brutally ended that venture. The extinction of airships, therefore, was something that didn't happen overnight. There was a period of coexistence in the skies. This background I'm painting here is important even in down under countries like this one that possessed no airships ever. Every household knew what one looked like. A country that wouldn't see the first official aircraft take to the air till February 1911. Every Kiwi household knew what one was. To further dispel the witnesses in this video are indicative of a less worldly era, less euphemistically ignorant. Take a look at this dirigible. Imagine if this air light, a term that was once used to encompass airships employed at the time, which has now slipped out of vernacular, cruising hauntingly overhead of your town or city. It would even today blur the boundaries between terrestrial or extraterrestrial. A craft of this design, having an unknown or doubtful origins, would instantly be frontline global news. Everyone would be snapping away with their cell phones, uploading them to social media, Fair to say, they would also induce mild panic in some quarters. I have no doubt this panic would be ratcheted up somewhat. Were this particular airship from a bygone era materialised today in the night sky, being indistinguishable was something out of a sci-fi movie. Admit it, you would blink twice and break out the tinfoil and go to the gun cabinet. Therefore, the reaction to a similar sighting would essentially be little different in New Zealand 2024 than it was in New Zealand 1909, where households were no different than others at the time, beguiled by the futuristic writings by Jules Verne. And like we do today, and contemplate other life forms in the universe when between mid-July and mid-September 1909 
Strange airships were reported all over the South Island. Chiefly, but not limited to these areas, let me give you but a snippet of what was in the papers at the end of July. This was indeed a hot front page subject, as well as being an over the teacups and jug of beer topic of debate and wonderment. July 28th, North End, Dunedin. A resident was awakened at two o'clock in the morning by a great noise emanating over his house. In Vicargill, the same night, over 200 people observed a strange powerful light resembling one from a train, beaming down and back and forwards from the sky, then disappear southward. Omaru again, on the 28th of July, a strange light attached to a large moving object is reported by half a dozen residents of the town. Skip two days later, Christchurch, the afternoon. A schoolboy and mother spotted what they described to be an airship heading southwest. South now to North Otago the same day, again in daylight. A farmer outside Omaru reported an airship moving at an estimated 30 miles per hour. Several other locals told of a similar tale. Gore in Southland, now on the 30th of July 1909. An airship was observed by residents at night, as well as the preceding five nights, with much the same description as on the 28th down the road in the city of Invercargill, in terms of its shining a large headlight or spotlight. Close to where all those Southland reports were coming from, on the 31st of July, the whole school at Kelso, teachers included, witnessed at lunch break an airship shaped like a boat or cigar with what seemed to be figures seated inside the superstructure. Farmers also reported seeing the craft, which hung around at night as well. The explanations for the phenomenon appearing overhead, which I'll get to in two ticks, were not too dissimilar to those we see today given the same circumstances. The first reports having been scoffed at, and then as the sightings increased, the possibility these, these things, things were real, real began to grow, witnesses having included a town mayor's, a policeman and a Presbyterian minister. Five odd years later, some of those very men making claims would be in the trenches in Belgium. These were stoic stock. Speaking of which, the mystery craft were known to scare horses, cattle and sheep. Let's now rattle off some of the contemporary explanations ventured in no particular order. Fire balloons like Chinese lanterns, pigeons, luminous clouds, and cosmic dust, marsh gas, black swans, wait, wait there's, more. there's more, reflections of Venus, Mars, Maverick Backyard Inventors, a craft being used by smugglers, Portent of Doom, Strange Aeroplane, of which I've already mentioned the country wouldn't see for another two years. That's even before we get to two of the Tier 1 theories. The Germans, pesky Huns, who had made it the 18,000 kilometres south to buzz the locals, being a dramatic thing to do, along with playing awful brass band music. Before you guffaw, the leading nations at the time in this field were the Germans and the French. One of their Zeppelins at the time would have fitted the testified criteria exactly, minus the spotlight. All they carried at the time were navigational lights, a major Herculean issue here, pointing to Zeppelin airships of any shape or size over New Zealand, this year, today, any day, would be a first rewriting history. There weren't any, never have been. Then we next move ourselves outside the Earth's atmosphere in 1909. Aliens specifically the ones living on Mars. That theory was pushed by an intriguing gentleman I've covered before. The eccentric 
Clement Rag. Clem was certainly edge of the spectrum, went hunting lost civilizations, toured New Zealand undertaking magic lantern astronomy presentations, a meteorologist of global renown. Rag was the first person to give storms names, starting with the wives of the superiors that pissed him off and politicians he didn't like. Link at the end of that video. It's a goodie. At this stage of things, it's important to mention New Zealand wasn't the only country up to this point having phantom airships scaring the family dog, as well as the entire rational family to boot. These reports started in Chile half a century ago, had subsequently cropped up regularly in England, Europe and Australia since. The best known and covered of these events was in the US in two batches between 1896 and 97 bound to be dozens of videos on YouTube on the United States encounters. It is interesting to compare the witness reports and explanations between the US in 1897 and New Zealand in 1909. 80% of what people reported, a size, cigar shape for example, headlights, descriptions, speed, etc, etc, the suspected culprits behind the craft, were the same. Overall, not a lot of deviants. The major two differences that stuck out to me were stateside the sceptics in a familiar modern vein that said it was a hoax as well as a secret government experiment. Here in New Zealand, against the flow somewhat, it was rather mainstream to believe the aliens were behind it. It was more of a prevalent theme. Speculations in New Zealand included that the alien craft was nuclear powered. So can I offer an explanation? Nah. That's because there can be no singular explanation. Do I believe they were extraterrestrial? Nah. How can you be so sure, Paul? Simple. The speed and navigation. Presumably, a spacecraft capable of travelling vast distances across space would have to have some sort of propulsion system capable of travelling at least somewhere near the speed of light. That's 300,000 kilometres per second. If the airships were ETs, why potter around at a snail-like speed? Hundreds of witnesses testified they were travelling at. Also, why do they all seemingly travel in a straight railway track fashion? Why didn't they change direction suddenly? Aeronautically, there are Cessnas and Pipers flying out of my local aerodrome, capable of outperforming these ponderous behemoths. Still, whilst my money, and that of the witnesses and expert at the time, point to a terrestrial origin, I can't explain away how a bunch of them ended up over the South Island when, to labour the point, Militarily and commercially, none of them have graced our skies. Even taking a second look at this intriguing event hasn't got me any closer to fermenting a credible answer. Let me know what you think and give it a stab in the comments. Give that video on Clement Rag a spin. Fascinating chat. Another tie-in. Conventional balloons over New Zealand. Piloted by daredevils their wives for sidekicks, parachutes and death-defying feats mean you are likely already to know the ending to this one. That's also on the screen and in the description. Bye for now.